So, so, um, so as I say here, um, the problem in question is Jeff's uh, 1999 work with uh, Kurt Cullen and uh, Andy Strominger on uh, NS5 brains. And uh, this is a very influential work that I listed some of the things that it was later used for. Uh, it was very important for strong weak coupling duality, 1995 stuff, matrix theory, holography, some of which I'll mention, and uh, these are solvably relevant deformations that I will also mention. Uh, I can't uh, go through all of this uh, clearly, but uh, I'll, I just picked some things that are uh, kind of uh, simpler to explain and fit in 50 minutes, and so I'll talk about uh, that. Uh, I also, since it's 9 a.m. on uh, Sunday, I kind of try to use the Hawking principle of uh, not having almost any equations. Um, I guess I already have to the audience before I even wrote the first one. <laughs> but uh, I don't want to have it further. Um, yeah, so... Um, oh, sorry. So I first encountered this CHS work that I'm going to review briefly in uh, the ICTP Trieste uh, Spring School. Of course, ICTP is now run by the Jeff students, so his tentacles are everywhere. Um, <laughs> in the other school, uh, both Kurt and Jeff talked about uh, this work. So this is their write-up from like maybe it's, it's eight, nine months. I guess when you gave the lecture, there was no archive. And when you wrote this, there was already an archive, right, Paul? It's like August 91 or something that the thing started. Uh, according to the number, this is the third one in December of 91. And it, it but the, the, the. In up since August. Yeah. So anyway, so this is uh, the paper, but this is the write up. There were a few papers in uh, journals. Now, uh, I spoke at this ICTP school about things that at that time I thought were, had not, nothing to do with the CHS work. Things like uh, two-dimensional non-critical string theory and its relation to matrix models, non-critical superstring, etc. But um, we had some conversations and I kind of uh, came away with the feeling that both Kurt and Jeff felt that these things are not unrelated. And uh, eventually it turned out, as I'll describe it, they indeed were not unrelated, but the relations became clear some years later uh, and led to many interesting consequences. So again, Sunday 9 a.m., so let me start slowly. Um, so in string theory, there is uh, the so-called Kalbramon Cal field. So, so Sorry. just a curiosity, they, they weren't calling them five brains then, were they? Well, here is the, oh, well, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. They're five dimensional. <laughs> you can call them whatever you want. But, um, no, no, I mean, it wasn't a, a joke. I was just wondering because I, uh, well, I don't brain know. terminology. Were you calling them five brains? I, I really don't know. H manifolds, right? H manifolds came later. Yeah, came later. I don't know when five brains, whether that was before or after D brains. Well, no, 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 black no, 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 black no, Okay, look, I, I will have some equations straight out of the paper, <laughs> and then we can discuss whether what one should call those things, if you want, okay? <laughs> I know Paul Townsend came up with P-brain. Okay, I thought the joke, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> yeah, um, so... Uh, we have uh, this Kalbramon field, uh, B2, and the string, of course, couples to this B2 in the same way that the particle couples to a H field. So uh, that's a standard thing. A Q1 here is the charge of the string, and because it's BPS, it's related to the tension, uh, which is uh, the string scale square. Um, now, you can dualize this B2. So the field strength of this two form is a three form. You dualize it, get a seven form. From it, you get a six form. Um, and you can write a coupling to a six dimensional world volume that looks like this. 
Uh, so um, this five plus one dimensional manifold over which you integrate this B6 is the world volume of an NS5 brain. You want to call it a different name? And now I just looked up the paper. The word five brain occurs 43 times. <laughs> the word heterotic occurs 18 times. Even if, it, <laughs> even if it appears zero times, you know, when you write something like this, it, it doesn't matter what you call it. <laughs> what does it say if you ask Harvey Omega? <laughs> So that's only yes or no question. <laughs> cloudy. <laughs> yeah, so this fine brain is the magnetic dual of the fundamental string in the same usual sense. And from Dirac quantization, you know that its tension has to go like uh, one over G string squared uh, in string units. And so it's a heavy object. Um, uh, it's uh, an object that curves curves space around it that kind of leading classical order in G string. So they wrote down um, Jeff and company the metric around it. So the metric along the five brain is flat in the transverse directions. There is some H that will be appearing in the next slide and the dilaton and the B field uh, also have some interesting values. The harmonic function that appears in that metric is uh, this it's basically the sources are at the position xj the k five brain in this language and uh, so there is some uh, modulate space if you wish of where you put these five brains in the transfer space uh, if you put them all on top of each other the harmonic function is just this simple thing where r is the distance from the origin where all the five brains sit of course, in this case, there is an SO4 symmetry of rotation about that point. In general, that symmetry is broken if they're separated. Now, one very important thing in hindsight that um, uh, CHS pointed out is that uh, if you take the limit uh, G string goes to zero, keeping the distance uh, R from the five brains, say, in this case, fixed, you, this geometry simplifies a great deal. Um, what you get in that case is uh, flat space along the five brains and the radial direction and uh, angular degrees of freedom are described by some uh, um, exactly solvable world sheet uh, theories. Um, the radial direction is described by something called linear dilaton theory, which is uh, uh, textbook stuff. It appears in Bolchensky, for example. Um, and uh, as uh, those textbooks say, the string coupling depends on the radial position. The way it depends on the radial position is that uh, if you go away from the five brains, the string coupling goes to zero. This is, of course, because you sent the asymptotic coupling far from the five brains to zero. And uh, uh, conversely, when you go towards the five brains, it blows up. Uh, the angular spheres are described by SU2WZW model with level K. And so the SO4 symmetry of rotations about the five brains is realized as kind of an SU2 left and SU2 right. Now here, um, uh, as I think they also pointed out, K, the number of five brains that you need to use in this construction, has to be bigger than one. Um, naively, it looks like nobody can stop you from just looking at one five brain, you know, just writing this with K equal to one. But uh, I think uh, what they say is that in that case, it looks to you like, for example, this H blows up when you go towards R equals zero, but it really doesn't. The reason you think it does is that uh, um, you know the, the you're doing a gravity approximation, and in the exact and alpha prime description, there is no such a throat. So, for example, they calculate the um, uh, action for the zero modes. You know, like if you want to move the five brains around, like turn on, say, uh, move the five brain from the origin to somewhere else. And that uh, zero mode is localized kind of in the transition region between the would-be throat and the synthetic region. 
Um, so um, this is a K larger equal to, than two, by the way, has been a source of uh, lots of confusion in recent years. But that's uh, another story that we're not discussing here. Um, now, um, something that uh, should have been clear when we were uh, at that 91 uh, ICTP uh, school was that uh, the situation is in some, in some ways similar to the two-dimensional string theory. You, know, you have a boundary of space uh, at large positive phi where the string coupling vanishes in both cases. And in that case, the theory is dual to the um, large n matrix model with certain double scaling limit. So it was very natural to expect something similar here, but there were a few things that impeded progress on this. One was this divergence of the coupling when you approach the five brain. And the other was that there was no obvious candidate for a dual theory. Of course, if uh, that's uh, the second thing is also true in two-dimensional string theory. If you just wrote down the two-dimensional string theory in, um, you know, in this asymptotically linear background, you would be hard pressed to guess the large n matrix model from that. The history kind of worked the other way. People understood the large n matrix model and then pointed out that it's dual to this two-dimensional string. Um, now, uh, as it turned out, the reason for uh, all this was that we were missing some facts. So one fact was the ADS-CFT correspondence. So most people here know about this, so I'm not going to we'll go over it very quickly. Multisena basically said, uh, let's take the world volume of the NS5 brain to be S1 cross T4 rather than L5 and throw into this strong coupling throat lots of fundamental strings. What happens when you do this is that uh, the five brains want to, the string coupling to increase. The strings want it to decrease. And so if there are a lot of them, the strings win. And as you go deep into the throat, instead of the string coupling blowing up, you just get some small uh, finite string coupling. And so you can study the theory using preservative techniques. The geometry near those strings is ATS3 cross S3 cross T4. Um, the ADS3, like the S3, is described by some WZW model. And so you can uh, go to work. Now, Mildesena said uh, this uh, theory, the ADS3 cross S3 cross T4, should be dual to some two-dimensional CFT. And uh, these people and others worked out the map. Uh, the map uh, was such that um, in, our, in our language, they were using different language, um, non-normalizable vertex operators in string theory whose correlation functions you can compute, like in uh, two-dimensional string theory, are mapped with to off-shell grid function in the boundary CFT. Um, now, in this particular uh, story of ADS3, uh, actually, even as we speak, the uh, exact form of this boundary CFT remains um, not completely clear with uh, even recent uh, debates about this. Um, so what, that's one kind of important thing that happened. Um, so, sorry, did, did Malsena actually discuss this or did the... I mean, uh, I, I think uh, 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 of, uh, the geometry is the same, right? Uh, and... Uh, um, but in some uh, image... Uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, it's some historical question. Did he discuss it in the first paper or in some later papers? Uh, I mean, this was discussed in... Uh, I think early '98 by lots of people. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's uh, I, mean, I mean, you know, once you understand the D1, D5 case, and you know about uh, kind of S duality. It's really not uh, a big stretch to understand how things map to each other. So yeah. So like I say uh, here, um, the um, understanding of uh, strong weak coupling dualities. Uh, explain why it is that we have uh, this strong coupling near the five brains. Uh, and the story is different for type 2a five brains and for type 2b five brains. For type 2a five brains, uh, since the string coupling grows as you approach the five brains, you have to go to 11 dimensions. And 
the, uh, the reason for this divergence in some languages that there is a non-trivial uh, conformal field theory living there. It's called the two-zero theory. And so the fact that this perturbative string theory approach fails is that. Um, for type 2b five brains, when you go to large coupling, you have to S dualize. And so you get the infrared free gauge theory on the five brains. And that is in that theory the reason why you know ahead of time that the perturbative string theory approach is going to fail. Um, so the bottom line is that uh, all these divergences are basically features. They're not really bugs. You know, don't allow you to, to do anything. Um, now, so uh, once this was understood, um, um, uh, we proposed a bunch of uh, people that you really should think about it as uh, an analog of this two-dimensional string theory story. And, uh, you know, propose that there is a duality between um, string theory and the CHS background and some six-dimensional uh, theory that is obtained uh, in, in this uh, scaling limit where you send just string zero, etc. Um, like in two-dimensional string theory, you expect to be able to map operators, vertex operators in uh, the CHS backgrounds to operators in the boundary theory. But uh, unlike that case, um, we don't really have, uh, even today, an independent definition of that dual theory. In some sense, the only definition of it we have is this definition, string theory on this space. Um, so we don't have the analog of the matrix model. Um, however, uh, this uh, does not mean that we cannot proceed. For example, we can describe uh, operators in the boundary theory using their description at long distances in the infrared. So an example that will be important for me uh, here is uh, that of the scalar fields that describe the motion of the five brains in the four transverse directions. So these are, of course, k by k matrices, just like you know the scalars that describe the motion of deep brains in the directions transfer to themselves are k by k matrices for the same reason and we can construct gauge invariant operators out of them um uh, we only need to consider this is a, some technicality that i don't need to spend time on uh, operators that are symmetric and traceless in these indices and so just in terms of group theory of so far they uh, transform in the n over two spin n over two n over two representations of su2 left cross su2 right which um, i don't know, we discussed before um, you can describe them in terms of uh, vertex operators as i said in some spin j representation of the su2 on the world sheet uh, i will omit this uh, the details of this construction um, but uh, i will use it for uh, the following. So uh, basically what I said, actually, before we move on to this, so the summary of what I said so far is that it's very reasonable to look at this geometry, which is asymptotically linear dilaton, to define a theory using this geometry, calculate things. Perturbative string theory will not work in these calculations because of the re reasons I mentioned, but that is not, in principle, a problem. Um, <clears throat> So if you want to do calculations, you want to somehow get rid of this strong coupling. So um, one idea that uh, is very natural is to use the fact that uh, uh, CHS already introduced into this discussion, which is uh, that if you have one five brain, there is no strong coupling singularity. And so if you take these K five brains and you just separate them in some way, then uh, if you go close enough to them you will only see one and there's no singularity so that by itself means that separating five brains resolves the singularity i think you're giving us too much credit because we didn't really feel like we understood one five brain um i think you point out um, uh, in one of those papers that this construction does not work for k equal one that's all i mean so I'm thinking, giving you the exact right amount of credit. So yeah, so um, 
So um, Amit Kivon and I pointed out that uh, there is a, uh, so of course you can separate the fibrins any way you want. There's another four, sorry. Why don't you think in M-theory lines? So can you comment on that? M theory picture versus the string theory picture because in the strong coupling dimension to go to the M five. Well, well, yeah. So, so if you keep the so say for if you have type two A five brains and they are on top of each other, so like I said, uh, you definitely should uh, in any calculation you do use the M theory picture, but M theory is just some slogan, right? Uh, M theory is glorified 11 dimensional supergravity. Like, you don't know how to do, you know, like, uh, say, if you have something that looks 10 dimensional for a large positive file, you write some open, and, and of course, it's therefore weakly coupled. You write some vertex operators there, and you ask, what is the uh, correlation function of those physical vertex operators? Uh, the slogan M theory does not give you an answer to that question. So, um, uh, if you want to actually do calculations, one thing you can do is this, and then you don't have to face that. Um, so yeah, so what we, so again, you can separate them any way you want, but we pointed out uh, with uh, Amit that um, there's a very nice thing you can do, which is pretty symmetric, and uh, is very useful for world chip purposes. So you have the two uh, planes that form R4, you put all the fibrins at the origin in one plane, so you still have an SO2 symmetry in that plane, and then you put them on some circle of some radius that you can tune in the other plane. Um, and what we showed is that uh, when you do this, you um, resolve this singular background into a non-singular background, which is like a supersymmetric cigar times the coset SU2 mod U1, what some discrete symmetry. Um, now, um, uh, so uh, one way to understand uh, how and why this happens is to ask when you do this, when you separate the fibrins in this way, which of those uh, operators that I mentioned uh, here get expectation values. So I guess I'm going a little bit slower than I thought I would. So let me just uh, make some statements and not uh, talk about the details. So an example of one of those trace phi 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 operators is trace of B to the K. K, remember, is the number of five brains and the matrix B uh, has uh, this expectation value. Where was it? So obviously trace of this matrix to the K is not zero. Uh, it's proportional to this uh, radius of zero to the power k. Um, and so you can ask from the point of view of the string theory, what is it that you do when you turn it on? And the answer, again, without derivation, 9 a.m., Sunday, et cetera, is that you turn on the n equal to 2 Louisville superpotential on this radial direction times the S1 inside the S3. Um, so in other words, you turn on some wall that repels strings from going towards strong coupling, which is precisely what you would expect based on this CHS story. Another operator that has a non-zero web is this. This is supposed to be a dagger. I couldn't figure out how to do the dagger on this. Um, um, uh, this is not another traceless symmetric uh, uh, operator of the group. And you can check this also has a web. Now this, when you look at the map to the world jet, is uh, a deformation that deforms this cylinder, the radial direction times the circle, in towards the cigar. Um, this thing is some supersymmetric cigar, and the leading deformation of the cylinder to the cigar is precisely the operator dual to this. Um, you can understand the subleading deformations uh, as well. Now, uh, from the point of view of the space-time theory, this is more or less trivial, everything I said. Uh, however, the interesting fact here is that uh, um, what this analysis uh, shows you is that uh, when you um, turn on the deformation that closes up the cylinder into a cigar, 
you automatically have to turn on this uh, n equal to two Louisville uh, wall with uh, couplings that are uh, correlated. So in other words, there's no uh, there's no two theories, one of which is this uh, cigar and the other is n equal to two Louisville. There's just one such theory. Um, now, so when we realize this, uh, I talked to Zamolochikov and he told me that they, around the same time, uh, concluded something similar for the non-supersymmetric cigar theory um, in some work that was never published. This is now called the FCC correspondence, but what's interesting about it is that it follows as a pretty trivial um, consequence of the CHS analysis. Basically, I have not essentially made any further assumptions beyond the CHS analysis and this map of operators in uh, the asymptotic linear dilaton background and uh, the low energy gauge theory. Um, and this is a, a, an interesting result because it's a special case of uh, some bigger story, which is that Euclidean black hole backgrounds in string theory always contain a non-zero condensate of a tachyon winding around the Euclidean time circle, which is uh, precisely what that thing is, this uh, n equal to two level superpotential. And this has been a topic of some discussion too uh, in, the, in recent years. So uh, any questions about any of this? Uh, now, uh, I'm not going to do anything with, with this here, but once you um, do this, you, when you deform this background, as I said, you can do weakly couple the calculations and, uh, you know, you, you get structures that uh, some of which are familiar. For example, you can show that these uh, off shell Green's functions in this little string theory um, satisfy uh, some version of LSD reduction. Uh, some are less familiar. This is a non-local theory, so the correlation function has some non-local features. Actually, could you, could you remind me one thing? I guess it is Sunday, 9 a.m., and I'm not thinking straight. When you say the tachyon, what, where does that tachyon come from? That we... Why is there a tachyon? Yeah. Um, well, so, uh, so in the context of black hole physics, <coughs> this is something you're familiar with. Uh, so uh, suppose you want to calculate the canonical partition sum of string theory, trace of e to the minus beta h. So there you just uh, take Euclidean time, put it on a circle, and uh, calculate the path integral, say the leading contribution from the world chip torus. But the important thing is that you don't, when you compactify on that circle, you don't want to do a standard S1 compactification, because if you did, you would be calculating not trace of e to the minus beta h, but trace of minus to the f e to the minus right. beta. So you have to change so the you do this uh, wrong, uh, wrong uh, yeah. uh, compactification. Um, what that means is that uh, for so this is uh, the content of this Attic Witten paper from the eighties. What this means is that for uh, even winding number around the Euclidean time circle the GSO projection is like it is for zero winding. Wow. And for odd winding number, exactly. it's the opposite. Okay, thanks so, for reminding me. And uh, <clears throat> in, in black hole physics, uh, it, it's kind of natural because, you know, if you want the background to be smooth around the tip, this is this exponential map, right, that relates the region near the tip and the region at infinity. And uh, so if you don't want a singularity near the origin, you need the uh, the boundary yeah. condition. Thank you know, basically, you. it's like Neve Schwartz fermions. Yeah. On the cylinder, they break supersymmetry, but on the plane, they, uh, it's smooth. Yeah. And so, the, on the, in the black hole, you have this kind of situation between the region near the tip and the region near infinity. So, yeah, so you can do all these calculations. And uh, I'm again not going to go through this, um, but uh, um, yeah, so uh, what I'll do instead is talk about uh, something else. So in what I talked about up to now, what we did was we took CHS, we uh, uh, used the properties of the space-time theory, like the existence of these scalars, 
and the map between traces of products of scalars and operators in the world theory. So we use properties of the space-time theory to learn interesting features of the corresponding world chip theory. Um, now, a more recent success uh, of this whole uh, idea of uh, using CHS involves kind of the reverse process. You look at uh, well understood properties of the world chip theory to deduce interesting properties of the space time one. Um, so, um, uh, as I mentioned before, when you add fundamental strings to the CHS background, uh, you get ADS3. But you can ask what happens if I take the near horizon limit of the five brains, but not necessarily that of the string. So here there is an equation, so I apologize for it. I'm not going to talk about it too much. You get some background that at large positive phi looks like CHS, and at large negative phi looks like ADS3. But there's also the, this fact, factor that just remains the same. Um, so you have this interpolating background, CHS at large positive phi and ADS3 at large negative phi. Now, from the point of view of the UV theory of this uh, little string theory, you're just talking about a state that contains a certain number of strings wrapped around the circle, a circle. Uh, but on, uh, what's interesting is that from the point of view of the infrared theory, what you're doing is you're taking a CFT, the CFT dual to this ADS3 cross S3 cross T4 background, whatever that is, and deforming it by an irrelevant deformation. Right. What the irrelevant deformations do is they change the asymptotic structure near the boundary. And of course, that's precisely what this background is describing. Now, normally, you would say there's no way you're going to be able to do this because of some general Wilsonian intuition. There is an infinite ambiguity. And so you know, you'll have to keep supplying new data as you go towards the UV. Uh, however, what uh, we pointed out at some point, uh, maybe five, six, five years ago, I guess, is that uh, this thing that looks like an irrelevant perturbation of the space-time theory on the world sheet is just a trivial uh, marginal deformation, some uh, abelian theorem type deformation. And so um, it's kind of weird, like there's some tension between the fact that uh, irrelevant deformations should not be addressable in, um, you know, in field theory. Um, but uh, here, uh, from the world chip point of view, you have something that is a marginal deformation, and so you expect it to be exactly solvable. So what's going on here? Um, so it turns out that if you ask what precisely is that irrelevant deformation that you deform the CFT dual to ADS3 by, it is some dimension 2,2 two operator that is a close cousin of this uh, TT bar that uh, figured in Per Krauss's talk. Um, <coughs> and the world chip description of this one, which is not the same as what he was talking about, suggests that you should be able to define and actually solve that theory. Now, um, in principle, um, ag again, the kind of history repeated itself, just like in 91, if we thought carefully about the physics of five brains, we might have discovered holography earlier in higher dimension. So here, if we thought carefully about all this that was known well before 2016, we could have discovered the TT bar deformations. But in actual reality, it took the field theory work of these people to make this point. Um, nevertheless, the, the little string theory point of view was actually very useful for lots of different things. Uh, Aki Hashimoto and I showed that the torus partition sum of TT bar deforms is, the, is easily obtainable by thinking this way. Um, it clarified, you know, like Per was talking about, given just a second, Per was talking about the question, what are the good observables? Now, he was talking about TT bar, but this theory is a close cousin TT bar, and here there's no question what are the good observables. It's some uh, solvable string theory. So we can discuss what the answer is, but clearly there is an answer. And we calculated some such observables um, before uh, in, you know, in this paper. Um, and uh, actually, uh, a place where it made the big impact is um, you could generalize the work of these people, the field theorists, 
from uh, Stiti Bar to a much larger set of, of different theories. And uh, you know, this gave rise to concrete formula for the spectrum, for the partition sum, et cetera. Lens. Could you just say again the role of the tearing deformation? Because Pt bar is irrelevant, tearing is marginal. What's yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so so um, so the situation is like this. Um, we have string theory on ATS3, and that's dual to some CFT2. Now, in the CFT2, you can ask uh, what happens when you turn on some irrelevant operator. Like, like uh, I mean, you know, I didn't specify what all these things are, but there's some operator of dimension two comma two, the local operator in the CFT two, and you can ask what happens when you add it to the Lagrangian of the CFT two. Now, all of us would say uh, it. By the way, it preserves supersymmetry, as uh, Sav and his friends looked at in detail. But uh, whatever, if it preserves or doesn't preserve, like you, you would normally say that you don't know what to do, right? Because of Wilson. But uh, if you now play the following game, you say the CFT2 is dual to some ADS3. So let me ask what adding this irrelevant operator to the Lagrangian of the CFT2 corresponds to on the world sheet of the ADS3. There, it corresponds to a truly marginal deformation of ADS3. Okay. And that, of course, you don't have any justification for uh, from, uh, you know, giving up on, right? Because a billion tearing deformations are not something that you give up on. Um, yeah, so there's a, a lot more things here that I am not going to talk about. And so <clears throat> I guess we have uh, maybe a few minutes. So let me uh, make some comments uh, in those few minutes. We still have a total of about 10 minutes or so. Okay, total. Seriously? I thought. Well, oh, we're going to 950, yeah. but you started five minutes late. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to talk for 30 minutes, but then, <laughs> so, so, so the instructions are 955 on this, or 953 or something? 950. Okay. 953. All right. So let, let me uh, spend those minutes on some comments. So, um, uh, so I, uh, uh, the, the main message I wanted to convey here qualitatively, of course, there's lots of details, complicated equations, you know, gum functions, but uh, the, the qualitative point is that those CHS papers provided kind of the first glimpse into holography between what at that time in 1991 was known, which was again this two dimensional string theory business. Uh, it, uh, to me, the, one of the important things it did was emphasize the role of the near horizon limit of the brains as uh, something that decouples the dynamics of the brains from that of uh, string theory on the bulk. And uh, as I demonstrated here, um, it gave a lot of uh, um, interesting insights into things that followed in the 31 years since uh, those papers were written. Um, now, I didn't talk about lots of things here. For example, um, uh, when you construct black holes um, in uh, the CHS background, uh, black brains, if you wish, um, this essentially involves taking the time coordinate from here and the radial coordinate and deforming it into a two-dimensional black hole. The Bekenstein Hawking entropy of these black holes uh, exhibits Hagedorn behavior with this um, Hagedorn temperature. And um, um, so, you know, and that is under control when uh, the energy of those black holes is uh, very large in some units that I don't want to talk about. So, that's uh, one thing that I could have talked if I had more time. Um, we talked about five brains that are just wrapping in R5, but there is a whole uh, zoo of those things where uh, you take the five brains to wrap different surfaces. Uh, or equivalently, you ask the question, what happens if you compactify uh, string theory on, let's say, some Calabiao and look at the dynamics near a conical singularity of that Calabiao? So there's a huge zoo of such things. And they give rise to lower dimensional vacuum of uh, little string theory. Um, 
Now, then there is this uh, k equal one transition. So, um, you know, in what I talked about, I told you that k is an integer and it, it has to be bigger than one. But uh, in this uh, larger class of models, k is in general not an integer and it can be smaller than one. And so um, there is some interesting uh, story that uh, is associated with what happens when this k get, goes through the value one. Uh, it's actually some version of the horowitz polchensky string black hole correspondence that goes on there. And again, it's a rich story that I don't have time to talk about. Now, uh, Per yesterday was talking about TT bar theory with negative coupling and was a whole discussion here whether you know you truncate the spectrum you don't truncate the spectrum so you can ask what happens with all of this here which again is not exactly tt bar but it's uh, some cousin of it and so we did a lot of work on this it's a pretty rich uh, subject that i don't want to uh, enter into like it's clear where the issue so you know when i said that you can calculate things and they make sense i meant for positive values of that, that coupling uh, when the coupling is negative there are issues but um, uh, you know there are interesting ones it's not it doesn't collapse this theory doesn't collapse as quickly as you might have thought um, now there are lots of things that are left to understand so they include the, the following. So, you know, like I, would, I, I told the lens as an answer to the question, you take the CFT2 that is dual to ATS3 and you add it to the Lagrangian an operator D of X. But uh, what I said earlier is that, A, we don't know what this CFT2 is that you have to add the operator D of X to. And B, because of that, we don't know what the operator D of X is. <laughs> so other than that, everything is okay. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, we have other reasons to understand what is the dual of a CFT2. You know, this is the one case where you're supposed to be able to do stringy physics in this ATS3. So in ATS5, because of the Lamont uh, charge, you know, when the ATS radius is further the string scale, with hoofed coupling to further one, you don't expect to be able to do much. Here you do, but we, you know, we're struggling with it so far, including the papers in the last year. Um, so that's definitely something that's important, but this is a more a questions about like what is precisely the CFT2 dual to the ADS3. Now then there is, uh, you know, Joe Polchensky likes like to ask the question, what is string theory? So, um, here, there is an analogous question. What is little string theory? Um, now, the promising direction is if you had an answer to this question, then it's very, very likely that you would be able to do this flow up because you would understand what this D of X is. You would repeat what the, the, these people did, some logic of company, and you would uh, presumably have a definition of it as an irrelevant deformation of the CFT2. Um, then there is the question of what are the states that give rise to this Hagedorn entropy that I mentioned uh, uh, earlier, this, uh, of course, yeah, this Hagedorn entropy. So this is something that uh, uh, Emil likes to call basically what, what are the little strings, right? And uh, I guess there are some ideas and uh, uh, Emil thinks that uh, it's related to the question of what are the microstates of black holes, etc. So uh, it's clearly an important thing to understand it. what are the microstates of those black holes, the ones in the uh, little string theory that I mentioned. Oops, sorry. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, my main message here is that it's been 31 years since the CHS papers. There's been uh, a lot of uh, Kind of they inspired the large literature that made important progress and lots of uh, things but uh, we're still not there we need to bring this circle of ideas to completion and so i guess the 75th birthday where paul will present the new jeff centric universe 
I will present uh, if you completion. <laughs> That's a promise. <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> maybe I'll, um, if I'll be alive. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. So, so you don't know exactly what D of X is, but can, do you know something about the properties? I mean, yeah, I have like, a, like, a lot of information. Like TT bar is, you know, very natural, and T has modes which, in the context of ADS3, yeah. by Rousseau, by yes. Brown and O. So, do you know, is there some yeah, yeah. structure associated with DFX? Yes. So, so, uh, so this, so, so okay. So, so the, the shortest way to answer this question. <laughs> Uh, and can you see what's on the board? Yeah. Yeah. So the shortest way to answer this question is the following. So um, imagine that um, you had uh, some uh, CFTM and you formed the uh, symmetric product M to the P mod SP. Okay. Um, it, like I changed topics on you. Okay. So uh, each of the P copies would have a stress tensor Ti with I running from one to P. And the total stress tensor, of course, would be just sum over I of Ti with I running from one to P. The story that Per was telling us is related to adding to the Lagrangian lambda times T T bar, where this is T. This D of X operator has uh, the, the same properties as the operator sum over I running from 1 to P. So D, uh, it looks like this. Now, if you think about it, uh, an op so it's, you know, it's SP invariant. And this operator has kind of a lot. Uh, so when I said that the, the, this, the operator D has a lot in common with TT bar, you know, the kind of thing I meant is, for example, suppose you take the operator product of D of T with D, right? So you can see that uh, the operator product is very similar, yeah. right? The main difference between them so is kind of, uh, this thing looks like a kind of like a double trace, yeah. and this looks like a single trace, yeah. roughly the analog of that. Um, so, so the answer to your question that it is that now things like these OPEs that I just mentioned. You can compute from ADS3. You don't need to know the answers to all these uh, complicated questions that uh, I mentioned uh, here. And that's what you get. You get the, the same OPEs as uh, in the symmetric product. Now, we kind of understand in some recent work with uh, Emil Bruno, uh, like why that happens. Uh, it is because in some situations, the space time, like in, in, in terms of this K, the space time CFT is a symmetric product for good approximation. But in general, it's not. So when I said to, that I changed topics on you, that's what I meant. That I'm not claiming that the CFT dual to string theory on ADS3 crosses 3 cross T4 is such a symmetric product. I'm just saying that for the purpose of calculating things like these OPEs, it I behaves as if it was. There. Yeah, I mean, can you say a bit more about these observables in your theory? I mean, you define them from the world sheet point of view, but so I guess yeah, I, I, could, uh, some 2 I could tell you, but I would have to kill you with <laughs> <laughs> uh, <we'll, we'll> boredom. <laughs> <laughs> to say it in a different way, it's a very long conversation. I'm happy to have it if you're staying. Uh, uh, I don't know when you're leaving. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, I'm happy to have it uh, today or on Zoom, but uh, you know it would take us an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a very interesting uh, issue because um, you, you know um, so, so to give you kind of the thirty second snippet. Um, so in a local field theory, uh, usually if, if you look at uh, like how do I define the operators. There is some ambiguity, you know, like say when you go, uh, I don't know, in the Ising model from the lattice to the continuum, um, there's some question of what you do with the normalization of the operators, but it's some uh, constant, you know, you, as you know, you have to take some limit, right? You go to the continuum and you define the, oper the operator scale like some powers of the cutoff, right? Um, in a non-local theory, there is an analogous ambiguity, but it involves functions of momentum. 
And so the situation is much more subtle. Or to say it in a different way, when you have a UV fixed point, you can just say, I'm going to define my operators at the UV fixed point, say to have two point functions, one. And then, you know, I've defined, like that's what Wilson would say, right? I, I defined the operators and now I can RG flow them. So what I mean by the operators are the operators that have two point functions, one in the UV. But if you don't have a fixed point, like here, there's some issue, and that is the issue that would that, that our I was talking about. It's these kinds of issues. Uh, so, for example, you know, when I said that the observables are well defined, you know, you can say like uh, in the string theory language, I have this asymptotically linear dilaton space. I just declare that I want the non-normalizable wave functions to go like one times e to the beta phi times whatever at large positive phi. So that's my definition of the operators, and they just ask. But you know what correlation functions they have. But then you can ask, okay, why did you put a one there and not some function of the momentum? Okay. Like one thing, by the way, that's very easy to see that was already recognized in the 90s, like in that APGM paper, uh, not APGM, Aroni, Berkus, me, and Zyper paper, was that uh, correlation functions can be defined in momentum space, but not in position space. So, um, so, you know, it's a long story. Like, I, I, I'm happy to talk to you about it, but not today. <laughs> well, not now, at least. Does somebody else wanted to say something? Yeah. One more question. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, is the summary that the, this D deformed uh, conformal field theory is dual to this interpolating yes. geometry? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. It goes from F1 NS5 to just NS5. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, so as you can imagine, if we understood what the F1 NS5 CFT precisely is, um, you know, that would uh, go a long way towards understanding what the interpolating theory is, given the fact that we expect, it, like in the zymological details stuff, we can define it. Um, okay. All right, thank you. Yeah, you can. Yes, 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 you can.